the students. So glad to see everybody tonight. And Mary Ellen asked me to remind everybody out there to mute, and instead I hit stop record. <laughs> we're recording again? That voice isn't going to announce that we're recording again? <laughs> not, not to resume. Okay. Great to see everyone. I'm here to introduce our three wonderful graduate students funded by the Williamsburg Bird Club for their research. Uh, but before I do that, I have a couple things to say since I got the floor. One is that uh, I would just like uh, Ivan to tell us what he saw today while he had the ornithology class out at Lake Matoka, in case anyone doesn't know yet. So, so I'm Dan's TA this semester, and we took the students out to Lake Matoka, and we were watching the swallow for the lake for a little while. We had some tree and northern ruffling and barn swallows. Um, and then all of a sudden this big bird flies by and I look and I'm like, that's a weird cormorant. And I, I, I look really closely and it's got this really sharp bill and this kind of spread out fan's tail and, and it was an anhinga. Um, <laughs> you saw an anhinga for those a, not in the room. A new bird for me. Um, I've never seen one before and I certainly wasn't expecting to see one in Williamsburg. So. <laughs> Probably a first for campus, maybe for Williamsburg. And luckily it flew over towards our group too, so we got to see it. So I got confirmation that it was actually what I thought it was. <laughs> Second thing is I'm gonna ask for assistance from anyone who would like to uh, help me with a study that uh, we are doing. And that is that we need robin nests that are in const under construction or have one egg, no eggs or one egg or under construction. Um, only participate in the study if you're okay with that robin only raising two of its four eggs and the other two being donated to science. Uh, if you are interested in that and you find a robin nest, please contact me. I'm sure you can find out how or contact someone at the club. I really um, love to hear about your robin nests and come visit them. Uh, so that's, that's an, I could really use the club's help with that. Like, well, what if I know where Robin's nest is, but I'm not sure of the steps. So, well, yes, uh, you can tell me about it as long as she's not sitting on it. Well, she might be. That's probably too late if she's sitting on it, but I anybody, I'll, I'll hear about it and I'll check right. it. Oh, okay. Thank you. All right. So, unless there are other announcements that need to be made right now, I'm going to introduce the first of our three graduate student. Oh, grant award recipients, oh, and um, this is the Sheehan Beck Award, I believe that they get, right? Yes, to support graduate student research. The club generously gives us every year to, to our students, and they really need it. it. might not seem like a huge amount of money to those in this room, but it is a large amount of money for a graduate student trying to pull off a research project on a slim budget. So our first speaker today is Liz Elliott. Liz is a second year graduate student, which means she'll be finishing up in a few months here. She's studying the potential for communication between parent birds and their developing offspring. So the developing offspring are in the eggs, just to remind you, and are they communicating with the parent or with each other? She became interested in communication and animal behavior while studying biology at Bard College in New York State, where she investigated the effects of noise pollution on the breeding behavior of house sparrows. Liz is soon to graduate and she's excited to start a new career as a biology teacher at Phoebus High School in Hampton. So we're really excited to have her stay around, which doesn't always happen. And I also asked the students to tell me what their favorite bird was. And Liz's is, is a wonderful one, a wonderful choice. The hooded mergans are one of my favorite birds also. And um, I've been waiting for hooded mergans just to breed around here for a long time because they're expanding their range. And I think there's a pair trying to breed in this big beaver pond that for its colony. So what more to you on that later? Oh, where was it? These little space things. You still want to give your talk, Liz, or should we just? Yeah. <laughs> All right, so without further ado, Liz, please don't trip over the. I have smaller ones for my floral stuff, if that's what you mean. 
Wait, wait, wait. The one that I had, I have a whole bunch of them. Oh, you didn't take a lot. Which one do I remember? No, uh, I didn't see. You never really found them. I have them somewhere. I don't know where they are. That's where they are. 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 Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right, I'm watching the view our fur club. Right, right. And you are slideshow presenter view. Mm -hmm. You're on. All right. This is you just. Thank you. Thank you. Great. Hello, everyone. Um, okay. Pretty close. Okay. Probably swivel that. Um, my name is Liz. Um, I work in John Swaddle's lab, which I'm sure you're familiar with, uh, at the College of William and Mary. And today I'm going to be talking to you a little bit about communication, um, but in a way that's a little unfamiliar, and that's uh, communication between a parent bird and its developing embryo in the egg. Um, and before that seems kind of sci-fi, um, we actually do it as humans all the time. We, we talk to our babies, we play music to our babies, all in a hope to sort of stimulate them or, or help them somehow on the outside world, right? Um, and it turns out that birds, and here I have pictured zebra finch, um, they also talk to their babies. But what we don't know is whether or not they can talk back. So that's what I'm interested in. And as the title of my talk alludes, there's actually not much talking going on, but I will get to that in a little bit. But first off, what do I mean by communication? So communication requires a sender and a receiver, right? It's a, it's a conversation. So we've got the transfer of information from that sender to that receiver. And the most important part here that actually qualifies it as communication is that we have that response back, right? So we can imagine a bird alerting, you know, there's a predator in the area, right? And that alone is just signaling. But when its neighboring bird actually flies for cover, then we have communication, right? So it's that response that's really important. And I'll get back to that later. And another thing I want to say is that communication isn't always through sound, right? So we can imagine instead of hearing the predator, perhaps we just see the predator. They, the bird smells it or feels the vibrations of its footsteps, right? All these wonderful channels that we can have communication through, hint, hint, vibration. Um, and so now we have an idea of what communication is. I want to throw in here the possibility that that receiver could be an embryo, right? And uh, so we can think about this as being prenatal communication, communication before that egg is actually hatched. So what does an egg need to know, right? Why might it be a receiver of information? It's just isolated in this little packet. What does it need to know about the outside world? And it turns out for the developing zebra finch, they have a lot to learn from the, the calls of their parents. Um, so they're native to um, the Australian desert. So they're experiencing temperatures above 100 degrees on a regular basis. So the, the potential for them to be able to adapt to those heat, that heat, uh, those temperatures is really essential. And it, uh, sorry. Um, but how might an embryo actually know, right, what's happening on the outside world? Because it, it's quite discreet in this little nest and it's under its incubating mother. Um, well, it turns out that adult zebra finch kind of act like we weathermen. So when the temperatures go above 80 degrees, they emit this really interesting call. And it's different from all the other calls in their repertoire. And it's called a heat call. Can we just ask to make sure folks are all muted. There's apparently some background noise. Oh, okay. Noise. Um, just making sure that all folks are muted because there's a little bit of background noise. Okay, that's a weird thing. <laughs> um, so they emit this really bizarre call. And so the hotter it gets, the more they're calling. So you can imagine for perhaps a listening embryo, because they can hear, but that might be really good information. The more they hear that call, the hotter it's likely is outside. And my collaborators tested to see if that might be true, if this information is relevant to a developing embryo. And they actually played this call in absence of any sort of changes in heat. And they found that these eggs developed and hatched into really heat tolerant individuals. So not only did they prefer hotter locations, but they did better in hotter locations. So if we put that into the framework of communication, We've got the sender, the parent, the signal, that heat call, and the receiver, the egg, and that long-term response. But what I wanted to know is 
there's a lot of time between the reception of that signal and the response we're talking about. What's happening immediately? Is there anything in the egg that's going on that could potentially be feedback? Something that could potentially be a signal that the parent could then pick up on or perhaps the neighboring siblings in the nest? So I wanted to ask that question. But importantly, you might be asking, how does an egg communicate, right? Um, so we'll go back to sort of those other channels of communication I was talking about here. And first we might think of sound. Are they able to vocalize in the egg? Well, some birds can, but unfortunately zebrafish cannot. So that's kind of out of the question. But visual cues and chemical cues, they can't really go too far beyond the egg. But vibrations, we can, we can kind of imagine that, right? We've got, there's actually a lot of movement and jiggling that's going on inside of the egg. And all the heart rate, those limb movements, they're all generating really subtle vibrations at the surface of the egg. Things that, as I said, could potentially be picked up on by the incubating parent right on top, right? Or those uh, other siblings in the nest. So that brings me to my questions. First, I needed to know, Okay, do eggs vibrate at all? And how fast and how strong? And then two, do applying these heat calls to them cause them to vibrate differently? So how do we measure vibrations? <laughs> and this is where we get a little bit sci-fi. Um, we use lasers. And um, basically what I've done here, so you see I've got a nice little schematic, but on the side is what my experiment actually looked like. Um, and I, I put the eggs at that tiny little red glowing thing in the incubator there. And I cut a little hole in the side so that the laser could touch its surface. And basically the laser touching its surface tells us two things. It tells us, okay, how fast is the egg vibrating, right? So how fast is the surface of it moving and how strongly is it moving? How much energy is behind it? So if we kind of go back to the limb movements, it's how fast is it moving its limbs? How much energy is behind it? And to break that down a little bit further, when we think about um, vibrations, we usually imagine them as an S-shaped wave or a sine wave. And it varies on the spectrum from low frequency being sort of the, where the peaks and the troughs of that wave are further apart. So you can imagine sort of a slower movement of the egg all the way to a really fast high frequency movement. So it's really, really fast, right? And the same goes for the amplitude as well, where we can have sort of these really soft, weak vibrations and then things that are really strong and powerful. So back to my question, do we see these characteristics coming from the egg? How fast, how strong? So as it turns out, how eggs vibrate at many different speeds. And let me break that down a little bit. So that signal is really complex. They're not vibrating in one particular way. You can kind of imagine it as there's all of these different processes that are going on inside the egg. You have a, you know, the limb movements, right, is generating one type of vibration, which we can identify by its frequency. And we have another, perhaps the heart rate, right? Things we don't know yes, necessarily know yet, but we can think about. And the important thing is that most of these vibrations are pretty consistent over time. So they're not getting stronger and they're not getting weaker. And that can make sense, right? If we think about the heart vibrating, right? Our heart without stimulation is staying pretty consistent most of the time. But now what happens when we play that heat call? Are eggs vibrating differently? So as it turns out, most of those vibrations that I was talking about aren't really affected by this heat call. But very low frequency vibrations, which we can expect from limb movements and other muscular movements, do seem to be affected by this heat call. So they're getting stronger or weaker over time. And so what does this mean? So when bird embryos hear their parents' heat calls, the strength of their vibrations becomes more variable. So you can kind of imagine it being this sort of change over time that that incubating mother on top might be able to get as a signal, right? Or those other siblings in the nest. So, but is this communication, right? So we've got this signal that comes from our sender, that little embryo in the egg. It's this vibration signal. But in order to understand if it's communication, the next step is wondering, is there gonna be a response? 
So I actually have some collaborators who are thinking of making a robotic egg and vibrating it at the frequencies that I found and seeing, does the parent react differently? Do the siblings in the nest who might be naive to those heat calls, do they also respond the same way? But I do have one important caveat. We live in a very noisy world and we see where <laughs> birds choose to lay their nests, right? So on eaves, under bridges, can we really believe that this sort of subtle communication can be really happening in the nest? Or is it gonna be masked by all this noise? So there's still a lot of research that needs to be done to understand, is this an ancient form of communication or can it really be something powerful? Can it be something that could help birds adapt to a changing climate? Thank you. Thank you, Liz, that was wonderful. And um, everyone who has questions for you can hold them to the end. And I'm sure there's a lot of interest. Our next speaker is Maura Meehan. And Maura originally is from Cleveland, Ohio. She graduated from Ohio Wesleyan in 2020 with her bachelor's of fine art and zoology. Then she completed her master's degree in biology at William & Mary. And she graduated this last August. She currently works to protect our wetlands and other aquatic resources as a regulator for the Army Corps of Engineers. Maura's favorite bird is the house wren. She studied them as an undergraduate and despite their humble plumage, according to her, I think other house wrens may feel otherwise, but their beautiful song and bold personalities really made an impact on her. In five years from now, she hopes to be in a position to further conservation interests via legislation and implementation. So her talk is on conservation engineering meat in the form of bird collision sensors and take it away and don't trip on the wires, please. Yours was full metal flower? No. Rose cloud. From start. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, thank you all again for coming out. We really appreciate the support. Um, you guys might remember me because I presented last year uh, about um, the research I did for my master's. Uh, I'm not going to be talking about that though. Tonight I'm going to be talking about the side project um, because I had interest in trying to um, develop a sensor to detect bird collisions when they were happening. Um, and I achieved that by collaborating with folks that have an engineering background. So as many of you are aware, um, collisions are a leading cause of bird mortality associated with human activities, right? Um, and in North America alone, an estimated 300 million to 1 billion birds die every year. Um, if you'll notice, that's a pretty big range of numbers. And the reason that range is so large is because uh, the number of actual studies we have about this issue are pretty limited. So we have to extrapolate out from those. And, you know, that leads a lot of questions, hence why our range in estimates is so large right now. Um, part of the issue as well is the main way we get data about bird collisions is through carcass collection. So people have to walk around and look for dead birds. Um, and as you imagine, might imagine, um, that doesn't paint the whole picture because oftentimes dead birds get taken away by scavengers and sometimes you'll have a bird hit a window and it doesn't die right away. It's most likely very injured, but we might not ever know that it hit in the first place. So um, as limited as our current understanding is, um, there are some things we know. Uh, for example, these four species here, the Swainson's thrush, the American robin, the dark-eyed junco, and the white-throated sparrow collide most frequently out of any species we have recorded as having died from a collision. Um, but what's interesting is we 
can't really predict which species are going to collide and which aren't. So definitely more research is needed um, to figure out you know, why some species do and why some don't. Um, something we do have a pretty good understanding of is uh, there are a few environmental factors that are strongly correlated with collisions. Um, unsurprisingly, total area of glass tends to drive collisions as well as adjacency to habitat. So if you have a lot of green space or landscaping nearby, um, you'll probably have more collisions that way. Um, and that makes sense intuitively, uh, but the data that we do have support that as well. The big question mark in my mind at least is how do lighting conditions play into all of this? Uh, as you can see from this lovely series of Monet paintings here, the same building can look very, very different depending on what time of day it is and what the weather conditions are. Um, and because we don't actually know exactly when birds are colliding with windows, we don't have a good idea of what they're experiencing and what lighting conditions might drive collisions in the first place. So that gave me the idea of trying to figure out how we can measure bird collisions in real time. Um, so pretty quickly, I knew I wanted to develop a sensor of some kind. But as someone who is technologically challenged in some ways, uh, I knew I needed a little bit of help. Um, so I went to the William & Mary Makerspace, which is an awesome resource on campus um, where there are faculty and student employees that help any vision you have become reality. So they helped me um, pick out some hardware. So they got me set up with a miniature computer and a couple different kinds of sensors. Um, they taught me a little bit about programming, um, so I learned, you know, how we can actually design a device to do what I wanted to do, um, and they helped me put it together to make a prototype. Um, unfortunately, <laughs> that got me pretty far, but I sort of got stuck, and it was my side project, so I was like, oh, you know, that's okay, but um, my advisor caught wind of some researchers at Indiana University who had the same idea as me. Um, and we started collaborating. Uh, also, there were engineering students at Indiana University that heard about our project and wanted to help. Um, so they were our support on the technical side of things. Um, so the advantages of working together like that is we actually were able to choose better equipment that was better suited to our needs. Um, we could share funding because I don't know if you know this, but during the pandemic, um, computer equipment got really, really expensive. So it was good to pool funding in that way. Um, and we met frequently over Zoom to discuss our ideas and um, help get the project moving along. So what did we actually come up with? Um, the device itself is in two parts. The first um, is a miniature computer with a microphone and a vibrometer attached to it. Um, and both of those sensors are running at the same time. And the reason we did two and not just the one is because when something actually impacts the window, you're gonna have a sound and a vibration. Um, but if you only had the microphone or the vibrometer, there could be other noises and other stimulus um, that aren't anything hitting the window at all. So by having both, um, we're already filtering out a bunch of irrelevant background noise basically. So we're doing ourselves a favor in that respect. So the other part of the device is another miniature computer that has a camera set up. So um, that component actually goes inside and the camera's looking at the window and recording video all the time. So when both the microphone and the vibrometer are triggered, we can go back and watch the video to see, was that a bird? Was that a tree branch? Was that rain? Um, but as you might imagine, it's very labor intensive to go through hours and hours of footage. So we didn't. Um, we actually utilized something called a, a circular buffer, which is the same sort of technology that a security camera uses. Um, so it's recording all the time, but it only saves a video clip when there's some kind of stimulus. So in the case of a security camera, that's like motion detection or infrared, but in our case, it's when both our microphone and our vibrometer was triggered. So just to explain that concept a little bit more, um, I have a little diagram for you. So you can think of 
um, these five boxes here as our five seconds of memory. And all the way on the right, you have the second, it's right now. Then all the way on the left, you have five seconds ago. Um, and right now you can see there is no sound or vibration detected. So say we get a collision, whether it's a bird or something else, doesn't matter at this stage. Um, we actually don't wanna save the video quite yet because we'll have the before and the first half of the during, but we don't know what's happened after. So actually we wanna wait, wait again. And then when that stimulus is in the middle of our chunk of memory, that's when we wanna save the video because then we have a relatively short video clip but we get the before, during, and after. So what do we do with that? We just have a bunch of video clips now, right? Well, the idea is actually we're gonna use machine learning. So eventually an algorithm or the computer is going to be able to distinguish between a bird collision and something else. So the way to accomplish that is you have to give a computer lots and lots and lots of examples. And that way it can learn the signature of a bird collision and differentiate it from everything else. Um, so the way that we accomplish generating all of this, uh, all of these examples to give the computer is um, two ways. Uh, firstly, that's simulating collisions in a lab with things that are kind of like a bird. Um, while that's not the most accurate, uh, we could generate a lot more examples that way and kind of start to train the algorithm and give it an idea of what a bird collision is like. Um, the next step is to verify tests uh, out in the field with the video clips and the circular buffer I mentioned. So the whole video clip process is kind of step two. Um, so once we start to train the algorithm, then we put the sensor out in the wild with our camera clips and we can go back and watch and then the computer can further refine because with these real world examples, we can say, these ones were birds, these ones are not. Um, the end goal is that hopefully this can be totally automated in the future. So we can just put sensors up, connect it to an app on your phone, and you can get a good idea of when bird collisions are happening. So that's pretty much where uh, my part in this story ended, because uh, as Dan said, I finished up this past August, but um, super exciting. Um, some undergraduate students in my advisor's lab took interest in this project and they're carrying it on as we speak. Um, so their first step was to connect the sensors to the Wi-Fi, which sounds easy because your phone connects to the Wi-Fi every day, um, but it's a different story with something like this and it took them months of working with the IT department but they did it um, and that means they can get data live from the sensors on their laptops in their dorm rooms. Um, the next step was uh, they, they picked their site where they wanna put the sensor and they had to calibrate the camera to make sure it was focused and the brightness was right so they could actually use these video clips, right? And now that's all set up. So they're going to start monitoring a building on campus any day now, which is super exciting. So the ultimate goal with something like this um, is to benefit research ultimately, because when we know exactly when collisions are happening, we can look at what time it happened, look at the weather that day, and maybe that can give us a little bit of a better idea of what's going on, what's causing this. Um, also, uh, if we can track collisions as they're happening, we can get more accurate estimates, because if you'll remember, all we have right now is a guess. Um, and this can actually give us the numbers. Um, another benefit would be we can test the efficacy of products that are meant to stop collisions. So there's lots of things on the market. I'm sure you guys know the window films, the stickers, the cord that you can put in front of windows. Um, and we're relatively sure those things help, but we don't know how much they help. So if we actually had a sensor to measure collisions, we'd know exactly how much they help. So obviously all of this is pretty preliminary, but you know, once it gets off the ground, it'll be a total game changer for this field. But in the meantime, I'm sure you're wondering, what can you do in terms of preventing bird window collisions? Well, firstly, turn off your lights at night. I'm sure many of you know this, but 
Migrating birds migrate at night, many often, oftentimes, and um, they can be distracted and disoriented by artificial lighting at night. So turn off your lights in your house at night. Um, secondly, avoid creating ecological traps. If you have like a super amazing bird feeder set up and you planted a bunch of native wildflowers in your backyard, um, maybe consider doing something about your sliding glass door. <laughs> Uh, last and certainly not least, um, spread the word. I can only tell so many people. Um, so tell your friends, family, and anybody else who will listen to you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Maura, that was great. Can you guys believe that this club is funding all this research on lasers and vibrometers and come a long way from just going out and you know measuring eggs and things like that? Unbelievable. So our final speaker is Joey DiLiberto. And Joey is a second year biology graduate student at William Mary. And he's gonna be graduating this summer. And he is from Los Angeles, California originally. He received his bachelor's degree in 2019 from University of California, San Diego. His favorite overall group of birds is toucans, but uh, he's also very partial to new world sparrows. And of course, when you ask Joey what his favorite bird is, he's gonna give you two answers. So he particularly likes white crown sparrows and I have to agree with him there, that is a wonderful bird. Looking to the future, he hopes to be continuing his research on how birds are adapting to rapidly changing uh, climate and world and we that we all inhabit and he will be pursuing a PhD next year. So uh, he's going to tell you about his research on house sparrows and lead poisoning and take it away Joey and also don't trip over the course. Our full metal jacket, right? All right, thank you so much uh, that you guys could come out to hear us talk. I uh, really appreciate your time. My name is Joey DiLiberto, and today the title of my talk is Full Metal Sparrow, which is a wonderful little reference to Stanley Kubrick film. <laughs> um, but with that being said, let's go and get metal. When I mean metal, I mean lead. So <laughs> on a bit, of a, a bit of a downer, but lead pollution and organisms exposure to that pollution remains a major concern for humans and wildlife alike. You may have heard this in the news recently, just right before Christmas, you know, Merry Christmas, there was a report that found out that there was a little bit of lead in dark chocolate bars. This was outdone in January when the FDA found a bunch of claims that baby food even had trace lead in it. And then for all of the bird fans over here, last year, a monumental study came, uh, found that half of all the bald and gold eagles, all of the eagles in the US were suffering from chronic lead poisoning. That means that either they're living in really lead polluted environments for long periods of time, or they're eating fish or carcasses that have lead shot in them. But again, multiple times. So this is remaining a big pollution and uh, a big problem. And we have very, ample reason to be wary of lead. Lead is one of those forever chemicals. It doesn't go away, doesn't break down, just like mercury and PCBs. And it causes a litany of really negative um, health effects and problems for many systems all over the body. We're talking about kidney failure, uh, anemia, decrease in bone density, and of course, well-documented shifts in behavior due to cognitive and neurological damage. Um, in a nutshell, environmental lead pollution acts as a major stressor negatively affecting organismal health. But a stressor can be anything. Here it's a, a pollutant like lead, but it can be predation, it could be heat tolerance, it could be the ability to see a window. And if you have some sort of trait to be able to circumnavigate that stressor, it can actually help you and increase your overall fitness. At the very least, it can help you get through that stressor. And amazingly, that's what we're beginning to see with some species. 
Um, this is a little small fish called the mummy chog. It's found right out here in the Chesapeake. And uh, some research about 10 or so years ago made a splash when they found that um, basically genetically, in polluted areas, like very polluted parts up on the Elizabeth River, the fish out there were, were having a higher expression of genes associated with that pollution resistance to all the, the cocktail of pollutants out there, and then a decrease in the overall amount of that of proteins and expression associated with size, condition, or even cancer resistance. Things that would help a fish survive normally if they weren't having to deal with this big stressor. Now, while we're beginning to see the beginnings of this in fish and plants and a few other things, we haven't seen this in terrestrial animals at all. Um, and we're talking about lead, all the different places that lead is, gets into the environment is in terrestrial environments, right? But that was all in, before we learned about the Broken Hill Sparrows. So Broken Hill is a small town in the Australian outback. Uh, it's pretty isolated. And unlike many small towns, it has a large mine in it, right? The mining town. But just like many towns, including Williamsburg right here, they got house sparrows and they have a lot of them. The house sparrows have been there for about a hundred years. We have records to show that and they run the town. They are doing great. And this is in spite of the, of the high lead levels throughout the town. So we have some collaborators out there in Australia who kind of saw that and say, like, how are they able to survive and do so well? So what they did is they took a genomic sampling in the town of you know, the genes of the sparrows, and then they compared that to sparrows found all over Australia. Naturally, this little isolated population was a little bit different, right? But in all the places that it was different or that their you know, the genetic genome was different, those were on genes that could be associated with lead or zinc resistance. And so this of course started a multi-university collaboration to understand, is this like the early signs of adaptation to like a polluted environment? Like what's going on here? And that's what, um, some of our collaborators, well, a few, I guess, basically people started catching birds like crazy, right? They took a lot of blood samples, thousands of birds were caught. And what they did is they compared different blood metrics, such as things associated with immunity, things associated with anemia, right? And then they, they compared that to the lead level found in the bird. And across the board, they didn't really find a lot of correlations. You would expect that if you were suffering from levels of lead that would elicit poisoning, it would impact your immune function, but they didn't find any of that. And of course, with all these potential physiological adaptations, it kind of posed some new questions. Mainly, do these adaptations extend to behaviors? But why behavior? Behavior is kind of thought as the summation of all these different systems. You could go out and measure bone density. You could go out and measure like how viscous your blood is or all these different things, right? But it, that's only one thing that goes into a behavior response. I, so I, basically what it allows us to do is like look at a whole different dimension of how all the different internal bodily systems are working in tandem to allow a bird to escape a predator, to forage for food, to find a mate. And in the end, that is what's going to be helping the bird survive. That's what's the main fitness goals. And so this kind of leads me to my main question. Do the adaptations in Broken Hills house sparrows extend to ecologically relevant behaviors? Specifically, I'm going to be looking at handling aggression or how feisty the bird is in the hand take off flight performance, their ability to fly away from a predator, and then activity in a novel environment, however they're moving around when exposed to a novel stimuli. Um, as we'd expect from my uh, prediction, within this population that's adapted, we wouldn't expect to see that lead having an impact on any of these assays. All right, so how did I do this? Well, first I had to get a broken hill. The broken hill is right there in the far west of New South Wales, real uh, red dirt kangaroo country. Um, and there you go. Okay. So the town itself is bisected by an active lead zinc mine. It actually sits on the world's richest deposit of zinc ore. But naturally, there's a lot of lead with that. And lead pollution has, well, it has a long history of dealing with and having issues with lead pollution. Um, and I can see here, like, the settlements and all the houses are, like, on right next to the mine. One of the places we were netting the woman's backyard was the mining lease. And of course, their backyard has high levels of lead. Um, regardless, house sparrows run the town, as I was saying. They are very abundant and have lived there for 100 years. Now, here's a map of the town in regards to um, the soil lead levels. One thing that's important for my study is I looked at high lead versus low leaded areas. Um, 
the, the reason why we could even use that is because of many years of our collaborators sampling the bird's blood and looking at the overall levels of lead. And there is a very strong correlation between house sparrow blood lead levels and um, soil blood lead levels, which kind of makes sense. I mean, many, I'm sure many of you have dealt with house sparrows. They're pretty persistent and they like to stay in one place for a long time. A study last year found that house sparrows could have their entire adult lives foraging territories and even their progeny's territories within three gardens. <laughs> um, so this makes it very easy to just go to an area, find, okay, well, what's the soil lead level? This sparrow likely has that level of lead in its blood. And so we have our high lead and low lead areas. Um, this also helps us out because as you can imagine, if we're looking at like flight performance and we have to take a lot of blood for a uh, lead test, might impact your, uh, we can't give the birds little oranges and water like when you give it blood. So um, this allows us to look at behavior more accurately. Here are the actual sites. And for a little bit of context, the actual like the sterile blood lead levels in the low area, which is that green part of the, of the town, they range from zero to 10 micrograms per deciliter, which zero, okay. 10 micrograms per deciliter is actually twice what the EPA was considered dangerous for a child or anyone to be exposed to with lead. But that doesn't hold a candle to the high area where we're seeing sparrows that have on average 40 micrograms per deciliter in their blood. That is like across the board lead poisoning. And yet somehow they're surviving, they are reproducing and doing great. Um, I mean, they're even juveniles that they have found, juvenile birds that have 100 micrograms per deciliter in their blood. Like how are they surviving on all this? Anyway, but um, so how do we go about all this? So we'd go up to our different sites and we'd catch birds using mist nets. Uh, this is what a mist net looks like. We'd, we would just set up in people's gardens because that's where the house sparrows were, right? <laughs> so uh, we kind of try to not get around the lawn ornaments, uh, set up the nets. And then um, once we caught the bird, I would run a quick aggression trial, ban the birds, uh, and then we would do a few take off to measurements, right? And then either the bird would go for the takeoff flight performance or the activity in a novel environment the bird would then be released because we're trying to do long-term monitoring of this population. All right, so for my actual assays, I'll try to keep to breeze through some of these, but the first one was that aggression assay. Here, we just wanted to see how feisty the bird was when encountering a predator, which is me. I'm always gonna be the predator in this case, <laughs> uh, scary ape for bird. But anyway, so the first of these three separate measurements was the struggle assay. I would just take the bird from the, its bird bag and put it up to my face and count how many times it struggle in 30 seconds. Then I would average the, um, I would count the number of breaths as the bird was, was breathing for 30 seconds. I did that twice and averaged it. The last one was an overall demeanor ranking one to five relative to other birds we would catch. Um, this is kind of a, a bird banding tradition. So it was one of our metrics. All right, moving on. Oh, wait, then. Okay. Wait, okay. Um, the next assay was the takeoff flight assay, which is we utilized the, uh, flight outhouse, the flight studio, but it was often confused for an outhouse, which caused problems. If you like, if you need to use the toilet, you can just, uh, anyway, the point being, we'd set this up in the field and we, um, it had three cameras, as you can see, little GoPros. I would release the bird from this, that little platform and it would fly out. Later on, I could use a software called Argus, which many of you, if you've been here long-term, a lot of the students have used Argus to actually look at the bird's flight. Um, I could triangulate and get positional data. So that's what I did. And to kind of explain what the different metrics I'm looking at, because when how does a bird fly? You have to measure things like velocity, the amount of energy that it's you know, using to get out off the ground. So each uh, flight, or the, okay, first the videos were at 60 frames per second, right? So, and each takeoff was 30 frames. So we're talking about a half second of time, which is not a lot of time, but birds fly really fast, right? So um, I broke that up into 30 seconds. And the first metric I looked at was from frame zero to frame one. And I quantified the takeoff force or that initial jump as the bird is getting away. Like it's, oh, I'm free from the predator, I'm gonna go. And I, and I measured that in Newtons. I actually had a physicist friend of mine help me <laughs> do the math and all this. But so I did that. The next one I looked at was the start flight, which I, I'm, and here I measured velocity and energy uh, over the first 15 frames. And that is kind of the critical point, right? As the bird is really trying to get off the ground and get away from the predator. Then I measured the end of the flight, which I only looked at velocity here from frames 15 to 30. Lastly, I also looked at the whole flight, which is, you know, again, measured in velocity and energy. So those were the actual metrics. There are six of them. So we'll go over it. 
Um, and, the, and this is what it kind of looks like as I'm tracking that. I just want to kind of show it once. But the blue line is the flight path of the bird. And I use all those points as positional data to get all of this differences between points for velocity. I won't get into the math, but yeah. <laughs> anyway, but the last thing I did was I looked at generalized activity in a novel environment. That little box is my novel environment. And it is a, um, it's, it's a kind of a well-known thing in behavioral ecology. Um, it's basically a sparrow jungle gym full of perches and areas that the bird can go in. And so what I basically did, I, I would, a bird would be released. And then as you can see, there's a, a little grid and there's a bunch of, per of perches. And I would have like quantify all of the like, different flights, the hops, the different movements, the, like the different like, sort of preening itself. And I could basically summarize all of that using some fancy stats into an overall activity metric for comparison. So that is my overall, like, that's that metric. Okay. Now, before I get to all my results, I want to share some fun photos of birds that we caught as bycatch. So um, across, so the, the first three are honey eaters. They are the white plume honey eater, the spiny cheek honey eater. And then you have the, um, the yellow throated miner, like a miner with an ax, like pickaxe. Um, very confusing because there's also a mina and Australian accents, mina and minor. Oh man. But anyway, the point is, <laughs> is that a mina? No, it's a minor. Anyway, right, moving on. So we got we have a mistletoe bird, beautiful little bird with a little red butt. <laughs> and then we have the gray fantail. Um, similar to our red tail, they like kind of flake with their tails insects. Then you got the crested pigeon, and then of course the, the Malie ring neck parrot, which was a very fun day to get out of the net for sure. <laughs> anyway, but with all that taken care of, let's get to what did I find with the sparrows. So um, with all, I'm gonna have some graphs. For all the graphs, the purple bar is the, uh, the area, like the high leaded area, and the blue bar is the low area. So the first three I'm showing you are the in-hand aggression assay. These are those ones like in the hand, how feisty is the bird trying to get away? And overall, we don't see any differences for the number of struggles, breaths, or the score. All those three did not show any differences between high and low, which is what we'd expect. Lead is not really playing a role here, it seems. And this is what we also see for that movement activity. This was like you know, the bird in the box moving around, kind of exploring the space. The low birds tend to be a little more active, but it's not different overall. Again, what, what we expected. And now we have the, the, the many for the takeoff flight. So the main thing here was that over the, the course of the whole flight, we didn't see any differences. But if you put a mirror up to the start, like the starting velocity, the energy spend over the starting flight and that takeoff force, you actually do see some differences favoring the low birds. So the birds in the low leaded area are like, they're flying a little bit faster and putting more energy into their takeoff as they're getting away. Um, so that was kind of the interesting result as well we, we didn't expect, but is rather, what's well, really interesting, right? Uh, and kind of going into our conclusion, you know, what does this mean? So I, I guess we'll start first with, uh, the aggression and the activity assays did not show any differences between the high and low areas of lead. So that kind of conformed to our expectations of that these behavioral metrics may not be impacted by lead, lead pollution. But in terms of the flight, we are seeing it only in that beginning part of the flight, a potential difference between high, like high and low leaded birds. Um, and the thing is in that beginning part of the flight, those first 15 frames, that's when the bird needs to get away. It's a critical period. You know, if the bird is trying to uh, escape from, let's say, what a cat or a dog, uh, or it's Australia, so maybe um, a dingo, a deadly snake, a spider, or a drop bear, <laughs> um, then they like that would be the critical time to for the you know the predator to try to get them again. And they're a little bit slower. They're not as willing to pop off off the ground. No, I mean, I shouldn't say willing, but not don't have the ability to pop off the ground as much. That could really in impact their. Uh, their overall fitness, there'll be lunch. All right, in terms of future directions though, um, we are currently, well, we just finished actually, an experimental dosing experiment here in the US with naive sparrows. Um, I, I, I do have the data actually, and I, I would love to talk about it if anybody's interested, uh, just seeing how non-adapted birds perform in these assays, essentially. Um, spoiler, okay, I'll tell you, they are affected. Because so they're not, because they're not adapted anyway. Uh, but the main thing, though, is that so this study was an observational study looking at like going out and collecting different um, birds across this gradient, in order to actually really look at like is this population specifically different, this adapted population. We'd have to like conduct an experimental dosing study in Australia with the broken hill sparrows, and that's what exactly what we're planning on doing, doing using my results and my overall methods here as a template for that. 
Um, and hopefully this gives us a better idea of what's going on with these birds that have somehow proved that life uh, finds a way. <laughs> and with that, I will end. Thank you so much to all my collaborators, um, the amazing undergrads, Kara and Alexander, who helped with the, the activity data, uh, all the funding different agencies, and of course, the Williamsburg Bird Club. You guys have been phenomenal. Um, and, and this is from all, of, all, all three of us. We, we really want to thank you for that, uh, for your contributions in, in like financially. Specifically, that flight outhouse, so the flight studio and the, the box where I had to buy all that wood and I used the money from that grant to actually build that in Australia and having to deal with metric conversions. And anyway, but the, the main point being that was really generous to you and I, I really appreciate it. So thank you. All right. Um, if the three, yeah, if the three of you want to come up because um, so the folks um, here will be able to see you. Um, so here or on Zoom, we have some questions for for our three researchers. Surely, my question for Liz. My question is: um, How old are the eggs when you first detect? So the question was, how old were the eggs when I first detected vibrations? And unfortunately, due to limited time, I actually standardized it. So it was all day 10 embryos. And it's around, I think, day eight or day nine that the heart is starting to develop. So that's beating as well. Mm -hmm. And so the, is the incubation like 14, 15 days? Or? The incubation is about 14 days, yeah. Mm -hmm. Got a question for Maura on the the sensors that you got set up. How big an area do, do they cover? Great question. Um, so that is how big are the sensors themselves? Um, the larger unit is the one that actually goes on the window, and that has the computer, the microphone, and the vibrometer, and it's maybe four by six inches. Different question. How much of the building can you see with those sensors? I see. Um, so the question is, uh, how how much of the building can one sensor one sensory unit detect? Um, we're not entirely clear because uh, you know we're we're just getting it out there to do field testing, but these are very very sensitive. So you know, my gut says if we wanted to monitor like one side of one building, maybe five or six units spaced out across the whole thing. Thank you. I have a question for you as well, actually. Regarding the bird strikes that you said, the most common birds involved in that, is that specific to this area or what area were you speaking of when you said those are most common? Sure, so the bulk of our data comes from Canada and the United States. And do you have any reasoning as to why those particular ones? So the question is, um, is there any reason why those species tend to hit the most? Um, that's a great question. Uh, the answer is not really. Um, migrant birds collide more frequently than residents do. Um, and it seems like foraging behavior, flocking behavior, aggression, that might be playing a role species to species, but we just do not know enough yet. The follow up to that is um, those four were kind of ground feeding, or mm -hmm. level feeding species. Mm -hmm. Does that factor in? Uh, certainly, yeah. So um, all four species that tend to collide the most are low flying ground feeding. And that might kind of get at birds that have similar foraging behavior, you know, certain foraging styles might need birds to collide more. Hi, uh, this question is for the gentleman with the sparrow. <laughs> sparrow guy. Um, isn't it true that a sparrow's average lifespan is only about three years, whereas the, e the eagle's lifespan is much greater? Therefore, I have you know, I'm assuming that eagle had many more years to accumulate, you know, serious lead poisoning, that kind of thing. 
So it, am I right in assuming that it has average time span for a sparrow is about three years? Uh, yeah, the question was just um, like, yeah, I can um, sparrows and eagles have very different uh, overall life histories and lifespans, right? Three years for a sparrow versus I don't know how many for you all, 20, 30. So uh, 20 years, thank you. Um, so, you know, how does that relate to overall lead exposure? And that is very true where you'd expect, again, that bioaccumulation of heavy metals such as lead or pollutants, anything into these trophic predators who live much longer. Um, and that's why it's also kind of remarkable that in sparrows, we're also potentially seeing some of these things at just ambient levels. Uh, one thing I didn't really mention, but so like as part of my dosing study, we are actually using levels of like lead that are, we're dealing, well, that Flint, Michigan, for example, are, that's what's in the birds there. Um, and even at, at those levels with naive birds, we are starting to see those effects. With eagles, we, we know that if they have eaten a lot of lead shot, they will have decreases in so many different metrics, right? People have been studying that past a few years, but even the little sparrow that, you know, is just living around an area, maybe accidentally ate a little piece of lead paint could be dealing with that as well. Yeah. Um, you collected a number of sparrows from my garden. Yes. Yeah. sparrows. And they were great, <laughs> very well fed. <laughs> so did you run them through the same tests that you did in Australia? And then did you dose them, expose them? to lead and then see how that um so the question is uh for, and this is for the the study that is was, was done or it's being done right now at um here in the u.s with naive birds just seeing <clears throat> if you do do the is the like the overall flight and is the activity does that decrease when you're not adapted not living in broken hill right um and the answer so far is yes across the board um the overall activity levels in this exact same assay after a a hundred day dosing, which is about two and a half months um, dosing period, decreased the overall activity levels of the birds that were non-adapted. And then th this was also what we saw with the flight was that over the whole flight, not just the start, the whole flight, the, the, the leaded birds did worse. Um, kind of further contextualizing the fact that we're not seeing that in Australia where we have three times the sample size you know, it's just, it's a remarkable sort of thing. But yeah, and again, thank you, Kathy, so much for allowing me to catch birth in your <laughs> That was so helpful. Yes. One in the back. Laura, um, you're the statistic of the 300 million to a billion annual fatalities. What, what's the source of that, uh, of those figures? Where, where does that Great question. So that's where, where do we get those collision estimates? Um, and I alluded to this somewhat, um, but uh, our, our data for the number of collisions that are happening are limited to very, very small scale studies. Um, and, you know, people who are good at math and statistics extrapolated based on those small studies. So that, that's why that range is so large. And just to follow up, are, are there research sources for that, that that we could go look at? I mean, as a way to follow up, um, are there, is there an ability to do that? Sure, so the question was, um, you know, where might you go if you wanted to actually see the data? Um, there are uh, some smaller studies where, you know, a researcher has actually gone out and organized a carcass collection effort. Um, and those are published, but also there are a number of um, community science efforts. So uh, I don't know if people have heard of the Lights Out program or the Lights Out Network. Um, they organize a lot of um, collision monitoring programs and oftentimes on their websites, they'll publish spreadsheets where they have their data. Um, and then uh, Flap Canada is the Canadian equivalent of Lights Out. And I think they, in some places, publish their data as well. Thank you very much. Question for Liz. You you look at the role of the vibrational communication in the context of these heat calls and you know possibly changing you know, a way that the young could change their physiology before they hatch. Is there uh, that's a very specialized context for this? Is there other are there other data or did you look at anything just to sort of establish 
that this sort of communication occurred or could occur in other systems where warning your babies about the heat isn't necessarily going on, but maybe synchronizing the hatching or other things. Yeah, so the question was um, sort of, are there any other similar um, systems that we're seeing communication systems like this heat call system in, in zebra finch where parents are sort of alerting um, or talking to their embryos, if that's right. Um, and yes, there are. I mean, uh, in birds, it's quite limited, but a lot of my study came from, uh, was inspired by rather a, a study done several years ago um, on uh, uh, herring gulls, I think it was, or no, yellow-legged gulls. Um, and essentially what they had seen is that um, when the egg was exposed to um, the parent basically saying, there's a predator nearby, um, there was a change in the egg's vibrational response. And what they found is that that was able to be communicated to others in the nest. So for, for those eggs that hadn't been exposed to that call, when they were placed next to the ones that did, they responded in the same way. And when they hatched, they had all sorts of behaviors that really helped them sort of against predators. So they were sort of crouching more in the nest and all these things that were really relevant to that original signal. In terms of other things that have been sort of related to temperature, um, that has not yet been seen in birds, um, but we do have a very willing uh, undergrad who's going to be going out uh, this summer to see, uh, to check out uh, bluebird nests and to see, because we know those nests go way above 100 degrees in the summer and some sort of communication like this could possibly be going on. Um, so we look forward to that research and maybe he'll be here presenting soon. Yeah, so the, the question was they have um, uh, at local schools for the bluebirds um, blink cameras that could provide sound and video. And yeah, I would think that would be amazing, especially because um, the heat call, at least in zebra finch, also sort of um, functions as a vocal panting. Um, so as a way to actually reduce their own you know, body heat, uh, their own temperature. Um, so that's visual, we can see that happening. Um, so that could be really helpful content. Yeah, we would get in touch. Question for Joey. Broken <laughs> um, Hill and Mount Issa are probably two of the biggest metal smelters in the world. Um, with a lot of other stuff besides lead, probably in the environment. Is there was there any effort to see whether something else might be contributing to this behavioral change besides lead? Yeah, so it could be cadmium and zinc. Those are the two biggest things that also are being belched out with smelters or are falling off trucks. The biggest, going back to that map, right, where you had this, like, you notice that um, it was green on, on the top part, and then like right on the south part of town, that's where like you had all the lead pollution. And that's because of the wind largely, like, and then, like, like dust particles. Um, from what I understand, they have like the cadmium in particular, because we know that has a similar effect, although less than to lead pollution. But I, it, it, the amounts are not as strong as lead, per se. In terms of zinc, I, I, we do know that the actual, like that the genes that they've been finding differences in the Mount Isa and Broken Hill populations um, does seem to also, it, it would work for zinc as well as lead. So maybe it, it could just be like a heavy metal stressor in true in general. Um, but the main reason we are focusing on lead is because that is the biggest problem to humans right now, right? It contextualizes things um, that all, mo more birds are facing. Uh, although yeah, cadmium and zinc are problems that you know are popping up in our chocolate, <laughs> unfortunately. Thank you. One for a lawyer. Is there, um, do you see that there's a um, large variation in the height of collisions and, and specifically going back to those four primary um, victims? Yeah, good question. So the question was, is there a variation in what height collisions seem to be occurring at? Um, and, you know, it's hard because we're not witnessing a lot of these directly. Um, we'll find that out eventually. Sure, yeah, but it does seem like collisions tend to occur 
40 feet and down. So in some ways that's good news because if we wanted to say put a window film on a building, we wouldn't have to do the whole skyscraper. We would just have to do the first couple stories. Great question. Yeah. I have a question for Laura too. Um, we're talking about, uh, we have a sensor on the glass that's approximately four by six inches. Um, so um, maybe I misunderstood, but if the bird strikes that piece of glass, say 18 inches above your four by six inch, how much is detect what's detected? So the question was um, how how sensitive are these sensors? Like if the bird collided further away from it, would it still detect it? Um, a collision on the same piece of glass as the sensor would almost certainly be picked up. And depending on how the glass is installed on the building, it's possible that um, collisions would transfer between panes as well. Um, we don't, like I said, this hasn't really been tested out in the wild too, too much. Um, so we're just gonna have to try. And that might look like installing the sensors and like throwing tennis balls at a building, uh, if I'm honest. <laughs> Mm -hmm. and you can see the, the collision, you know, two feet above the four by six. Mm -hmm. um, but if the camera doesn't have a wide angle, then you won't catch that bird that's really up there. It keeps up. Yeah. It's a combination. Yeah. Yeah. Definitely the type of camera we're using is something to consider as well. Yeah. Thank you. Also, for more, <laughs> I have sliding glass doors. Mm -hmm. And we bought a whole bunch of decals that are supposed to deter crashes, and it's not working. Do you know any surefire method we need? I actually could come up with a great idea for, you know, because I'd like to, I, I'm still hearing the thumps. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So the question is um, the decals that somebody bought don't seem to be helping to prevent collisions on their sliding glass door. My question to you would be how far apart is the spacing? Of between of the decals. Mm -hmm. uh, we know about 20 all sure. over the place. Yeah. Um, unfortunately with, with the decals, um I I don't quote me exactly, but I think they have to be like two to four inches apart from each other to really help. It's close. Um what I might recommend, I know people like this for their backyards. Um, I think the, the brand name is Acopian Bird Savers, and it's basically um, lines of paracord that hang down from a piece of wood. So that's something you can buy, and that's also something you can DIY. So not, not only is it a visual barrier, it's a physical object they can see. Um, they sit, I think, a couple inches out from the glass, um, so it might be just enough to prevent a bird from hitting. Thank you. Mm -hmm. well, um, if, I, if a bird hits my window, is there a place that I can record it to its best? And is that useful if just a single person is recording a single bird? Um, at this stage around here, I don't think we have a good system for an individual person reporting bird collisions. Um, I think Flap Canada is working on something like that. Um, but the best thing you can do is if the bird is just stunned, um, put it in a shoe box, keep an eye on it for a little bit. Hopefully it flies away. Um, if it does not fly away, um, your options are to leave it where it is or donate it to an institution like a museum that can take it. I know there are there were projects that I know to for documenting mm -hmm. for professionals. Yeah. Mm -hmm. well, any, anything else for our three young students here? Well, thank you all so much. <laughs>
Um, Scott will be there, a couple of us will be there in case the crowd needs to be split up, but we're looking forward to that. Definitely uh, birds are flying in, so uh, it should be a good one. George, would you like to say something about our upcoming field trip? Yeah, thanks, Nancy. Uh, coming up, or this is follow, a follow-up to our meeting last month when uh, Chase, Chance Hines was here talking about red cockaded woodpeckers. Saturday, May 13th, we've been granted access for a small number of our club members to go to Piney Grove. I put out an advertisement a couple of weeks ago mentioning this. We still have one space available. And if you are interested in going to Piney Grove on Saturday, May 13th, let me know. Uh, it's gonna be early. We wanna get on the 5.20 a.m. ferry to get to Piney Grove when uh, the birds are just waking up out of their holes and start foraging for the day. Uh, and I'll also add that the limitation is really set by the number of cars that are allowed and have space for at the preserve. It's really, they're not set up that way. So we've got to have uh, limited to about five cars and all the people that can fit into those five cars. That's what's setting the limitation. Anyways, Saturday, May 13th, bright and early. If you're interested, let me know and I will be sending out further communications to the club on that. Great. Okay. Yep. Thank you, George. Uh, Mary Ellen would like uh, the deadline for the May newsletter is um, the 26th of April. She has a lot of content, but she would love to get some recent sightings. So, um, and do you get a picture of your Hinga? It's, it's really bad. I saw it actually. I saw your picture, and it looks like an Anhinga. So, <laughs> if it's a if it's a Williamsburg sighting, a, a Williamsburg record, I send it in. Yeah. Yeah, we don't we don't uh, critique photography, so <laughs> yeah, you'll, you'll be fine. But anybody else who has some uh, photos of recent sightings, things that you've seen in your yard or uh, out and about. Um, is Jim Corliss on this call? I don't think so. Um, Jim is recently retired from NASA, so I think he's out doing something fun. <laughs> he is the man to contact if you would like to participate in the spring bird count. Uh, it's May 7th. It's like the Christmas bird count. There are teams, there are multiple ways of participating. You can do it as a, uh, from your yard or you can be on a team. And the more the merrier. It's a wonderful time of year, of course, to um, be out counting birds. So if you would like to be on a team and you're not already on a assigned a location, either contact Jim Corliss or contact me and we will, um, we'll get you on a team somewhere. Um, let's see, Patty, do you want to say something about our upcoming meeting or no, just that it's the, the fourth? Right, right. Our, yeah. right. 24th, okay. right. Our, our May meeting is actually the fourth Wednesday because the library was not um, available. And Jan Lockwood is going to give us a really dazzling program about her trip to Africa. So um, it's, it's just really great that she's going to do that. So I hope I hope we get a, a good turnout for that. So that ends up being uh, May 24th and information will come out. Uh, we'll send emails out about that. Um, Bill, would you want to say a few words about some VSO activities? So it's been my pleasure to be the president of Virginia Society of Ornithology 2022 2023. Um, I've got to say, this meeting is always a humbling one, and you all are absolutely fantastic. I don't think there's a person here who's in the room or watching that isn't terribly, or not terribly, but overwhelmingly impressed by the work that you do and the contribution that the uh, faculty uh, does to support everything that you all do, and keep it up. It's just fabulous. Thank you. <laughs> The Virginia Society of Ornithology is going to have its annual meeting virtually on uh, Cinco de Mayo, uh, Friday, May the 5th, 7 p.m. Uh, there'll be a business meeting, but uh, the featured speaker is going to be our own Brian Watts here from the College of William & Mary Center for Conservation Biology, who's going to talk about Eagles of the Chesapeake. Um, and 
you're all invited. Uh, there will be a Zoom link for it for those of you who are VSO members. If you're not, shame on you. Um, but uh, if you are interested in participating, let Shirley or myself know and we can get you to the Zoom link for that meeting for that evening. Uh, again, thank you all. You're just wonderful. <clears throat> Thanks, Bill. Um, anybody else have any announcements or? Yes, Shirley, come on up. You gonna tell them about our trip to Texas? No. I'll let you do that. No, no, no. <laughs> we'll be here all night. Um, on a, on a follow-up to the um, trip to Piney Grove that the Bird Club is sponsoring, the VSO is also sponsoring a trip to Piney Grove on, um, I think it's May 28. Um, again, it's a limited uh, number of people because of the, the limited parking spaces. And um, we're gonna be advertising that trip um, probably um, next week uh, or the week after. Um, and, but the, the key is you have to be a VSO member to join that trip. Now that's another reason to uh, join the VSO. I'm the membership secretary for the VSO, and I would love, love, love to um, see your membership come in either by check or by, um, by um, what's that called? Yeah. 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 Uh, yeah. Online, yeah. online. Yeah. Uh, okay. so, so anyway, um, and then um, the next field trip that the VSO is sponsoring is right in our backyard. It's gonna be over in Gloucester County um, on Saturday, um, they'll spend the day at Machi Komoko State Park, and then um, on Friday and Sunday, they'll be at some other parks, one of which will be Beaver Dam Park. So um, um, again, you have to be a VSO member to participate, but it's only $20 to be a VSO member, so it's worth it. Um, it's not often that we have a VSO field trip that close to us. You can spend the night in your own bed and drink your own coffee in the morning. So. Um, so anyway, um, there'll be some information about that in the upcoming Bird Club newsletter. So be on the lookout for that. Thanks. Uh, Okie dokie. I don't have anything uh, more. So I guess it's the fun time. Patty's going to do um, our return to uh, door prizes tonight. We haven't done this. What? I have a question. How many species of birds did you see in Texas? Oh, funny that you ask. 171 oh in four days, four and a half days. I had a life bird, Sprague's Pippet. Um, you have life birds? Yeah. Oh uh, yeah, it was, um, don't get us started. Although we, we got in at 1230 last night, so we're not gonna last a whole lot longer. Uh, so Patty's gonna- uh, Did everybody get a ticket? call out some numbers. We have three different feeders up here. So um, if your number's called, come on up and pick one of the feeders. We have the hummingbird feeder donated by Backyard Birder. Okay, hummingbird feeder donated by Backyard Birder. Dean and Bauer Shostak. The Shostaks. A tray feeder and bird bath. The tray eggs. feeder and bird bath. And a window bird feeder. A window feeder. And you have your choice. You have your choice. All right, last three digits. 182. 182, last three digits. Come on down. Hey. I want you to know this is our first meeting. Just well, oh, wonderful. Welcome. <laughs> Excellent. That's great to be a first timer and a winner. Yeah. Excellent. No, thank you. <laughs> Next one is 180. 180. Oh, Joey's bummed. He didn't. Oh, Kathy. <laughs> window feeder. And, and we have a hummingbird one feeder. Is 176. 176. Oh, Babs. Yay. <laughs> All righty. We have some bookmarks up here. If, um, if anybody needs a bookmark. 
think I well, thank you everybody uh, for coming out and particularly to the students and for Dan um, for taking the time. Um, again, this is my favorite, my favorite meeting of the year. You really do inspire us and um, we're gonna be watching for you in the future. We know you, you guys are going places. So thank you, thank you so much and well done. Oh, yes, what, I have a question. Sorry, I'd like to just say something for folks. My, my daughter, who lives in British Columbia and is a member oh. of the, this club, is, is visiting. Oh, how so, wonderful. Well, welcome. Yeah, no, I've been enjoying your meetings on Zoom. So oh, excellent. Nice to be here for a change. Yeah. Oh, how wonderful. Well, welcome. We're Thank thrilled you. to have you. How long are you going to be here? I'm leaving on Friday, actually, or Saturday. Oh. So my time's almost up, but I've been here long enough to enjoy the recent uh, bird outing at uh, Newport. Newport News. Yeah. Oh, excellent. Yeah. Excellent. Yes, surely. <laughs> yeah, would you, you guys want to say who you are? And... So I'm Mark. This is Darcy Patterson. Okay. We've lived in since October. Oh, excellent. Wow. Washington. Yep. <laughs> oh my gosh. Well, that's excellent. Well, welcome. We hope you'll take part in all of our fun activities. Okay, everybody. Well, um, thanks so much for tuning in on Zoom and thanks for all of you to all of you for being here. Um, and again, special thanks to all you wonderful students. Okay, with that, we are done. Thank <laughs> you.